Another painter who exhibited with the Impressionists was Hilaire Germain Edgar Degas, whose dates were 1834 to 1917. Unlike the other painters in this group, Degas was always devoted to studio work. Like Manet, he was from a wealthy Parisian family who wanted him to study law. Instead, Degas attended the École de Beaux-Arts in 1855 and then left for a three-year study trip to Italy in 1856. He shared the interest in modern life subjects with the other Impressionists, but was far less interested in landscape overall than in figure painting, especially of bodies, human, especially female, and equine, bodies in motion. The National Gallery owns 11 paintings by Degas. And by the way, many of the paintings in this lecture were also purchased with funds from the Courtauld bequest. Miss Lala at the Cirque Fernando is signed and was exhibited at the Fourth Impressionist Exhibition in 1879. As we saw with Renoir, subjects of modern entertainment were popular with Impressionist painters. Here we are placed in the crowd, looking up at the death-defying feet of this acrobat who is hanging by a rope which is clenched between her teeth. The unusual point of view and off-center composition were characteristic of Degas' art in this period of his career. While such compositions were innovative, Degas was as entranced with traditional modes of foreshortening as any Italian Renaissance painter. Degas sketched at the circus in January of 1879, as one pastel from this series also showed Miss Lala. This painting has a discolored varnish on it that cannot be removed by current methods of cleaning. And the problem with it is this. The varnish has orange pigment in it, suggesting that it was placed on the painting before the topmost layers of paint were totally dry. As a result, they intermix the varnish and paint layer, and any cleaning would be likely to remove some of the original paint as well as the varnish. This is precisely, of course, what conservators work to avoid, so they have to leave the painting in its present state. Hélène Rouard, in her father's study from about 1886, is an intriguing glimpse into the life of one of Degas' friends. Henri Rouard had met Degas in school, and they remained friends for the rest of their lives. While Rouard was an industrialist, he was also a collector and an amateur painter, enough so that he exhibited in the Impressionist exhibitions and helped underwrite their costs. Degas painted Rouard and various members of his family many times. Here, Rouard's only daughter, Hélène, is in her father's study with objects from various cultures, including Egyptian statues at the left and above a Chinese wall hanging. We can also make out a landscape by Corot on the wall. Meanwhile, the sitter stares off into space, inaccessible to us. Degas' paintings never evoke the kind of gaiety we associate with Renoir. Was Degas an Impressionist? Certainly his technique often departed from the others in the circle. Note the emphasis on contour lines around the figure of Hélène, for instance. He also made a number of preparatory drawings for this painting, which was atypical for Impressionists. But he was as committed to the subjects of uh, modern life as Monet and Renoir, and consistently exhibited with them. After the bath, woman drying herself from about 1890-1895 is a pastel, a medium which Degas employed repeatedly and often to stunning effect. He liked pastel because it enabled him to unite drawing with painting. Degas seems to have decided to enlarge the composition while making it, for the drawing is made up of several sheets of paper, which were then mounted on cardboard. Think of the Leonardo cartoon from Lecture 7, or, say, even the Rubens portrait of Susanna London from Lecture 14, where uh, that work was expanded while Rubens was painting it. In the 1880s, Degas turned to depictions of women, including nude bathers, seemingly unaware of being watched. They go about their tasks without self-consciousness. Here, the pose and viewpoint remind us of Degas' fondness of unusual angles of sight, as we seem to loom above and behind this woman. She rubs the back of her neck with a towel while seated on a chair next to a bathtub. 
Degas's attitude towards these figures and the women who modeled for them has been debated. Was this lifelong bachelor a misogynist, seeing women only as objects for his art? For instance, we never see the face of this woman. She is only a body to us. Was he sympathetic and intrigued by their private lives, often separate from men? As is typical with the enigmatic Degas, it is hard to reach any definitive conclusions from his work or from his life. It is in the pastel medium that Degas came closest to the impressionists in the vividness of his colors. Some strokes are blended, while others sit on the surface next to strokes of quite different colors, lending that impressionist shimmering quality to the whole. La Coiffure from about 1896 suggests some extraordinary changes in Degas' style by the late 1890s, if not in his subject matter. While painted with oil paints on canvas, the brightness of the coloring and its matte application almost make the painting look like a large pastel. The flatness of the form of the woman in red, whose red hair is being combed by her maid, is remarkably different from the depiction of Miss Lala or even Hélène Rouard. The maid seems fuller in volume than her mistress, but this form is silhouetted against the red background rather than really being situated in space. The room is murky and ill-defined. We see a curtain, for instance, at left and a picture hanging behind it. But what is in front of the seated woman? Is this a window? Is this a mirror? It's really impossible to tell. Outlines, too, are not as graceful here as in Degas' earlier paintings. One issue that needs to be addressed when considering this painter's stylistic development is his eyesight. Many letters by Degas to friends make clear how much he struggled with his vision from the 1880s onward. Some clues from these letters and from his art suggest that he may have developed macular degeneration, which causes central vision to blur and decay. It is thus telling that Degas increasingly painted pictures with heads turned away so that you wouldn't see the face, and avoided portraiture in his later years, a subject that requires keen vision to characterize a sitter. Yet Degas himself said, one sees as one wishes to see. Any deficits in his vision were matched and surpassed by his increasingly brilliant coloristic effects. It is not surprising, perhaps, that the great 20th century colorist Matisse owned this painting. One final work by Degas brings us right up to the 20th century. Ballet dancers dates from the period of about 1890 to 1900. Degas had painted ballet dancers repeatedly since the 1870s. As a subject, they offered him the opportunity to study female figures in motion and to concentrate on a theme of modern Parisian entertainment. As in La Coiffure, Degas has used oil paint in very dry, matte layers. Much of the ground is actually visible throughout the painting here. The fresh and bright blue, green, yellow, red, and mauve gray tones sit on the surface of the canvas, while only here or there is a contour line. The dancers dissolve into each other, and their faces seem blank, except for the foremost dancer. She has stopped to adjust her slipper in a pose Degas had used time and time again. Perhaps his trained memory of this pose made it easier to depict than other stances with his degraded eyesight. Even her face, though, is blurred and inexpressive. I find this to be an incredibly brave and moving art. The final effect of the scene is as if a dream, and perhaps for Degas this was true, that these final paintings of his are as much dream works as actual paintings. Three of the five Degas paintings I've discussed all have the stamp that was placed on work sold out of the painter's studio in 1918 after his death. And these were um, among some collectors particularly prized since they were the ones Degas kept with him till the end of his life. One last painter to consider who exhibited with the Impressionists is Paul Cezanne, whose dates were 1839 to 1906. From a wealthy family like Degas and Manet, Cezanne came from Aix-en-Provence, 
Again, like these other two artists, his father wanted him to be a lawyer, but eventually reconciled with his son's painting vocation. Cezanne first came to Paris in 1861 and came to know the Impressionists through a friendship with Pizarro in the 1870s. He exhibited in the first and third Impressionist exhibitions, and it was in the 1870s that his artistic goals most closely aligned with theirs in working from nature and recording one's immediate observations. From the 1870s onward, Cezanne lived primarily in Provence, though he returned to Paris as well and also sent his work there for exhibition. Working alone from the 1880s, he developed a style that has come to be associated with the term post-Impressionism. There are nine paintings by Cezanne in the National Gallery. And post-Impressionism, by the way, is another one of these uh, terms that was applied later to the art of this period. It was actually first used in the early uh, 20th century by a critic of art, but in this case, admiringly. Cezanne's self-portrait from about 1880 or 1881 is a product of the period when Cezanne was searching for new answers for his art. He was beginning to feel limited by the Impressionist aesthetic of direct naturalism. A moody man, Cezanne seems to have wanted to create an art of greater structure and order, an interpretation of nature as part of his own struggle to gain internal equilibrium. That search is reflected here in the geometric construction of the self-portrait. Cezanne shows himself at bust length standing in front of decorative wallpaper. Note how his jacket lapel, which is turned up, has a jagged edge to it that echoes the diamond shapes of the pattern in the wallpaper behind him. Cezanne has also reduced his head to an egg-shaped form that comes to a point with his beard in front. Most striking is the application of paint on his head where we see both rectangular and diamond-shaped areas of a single paint color that overlap each other without blending. Larger than brush strokes, these patches of color do not echo the Impressionist attempt to capture the transient appearance of light and color, but rather serve to increase the sense of basic geometry of structure in this image. This imposition of a design structure helps to create an image of Cezanne as controlled or even impassive. The turn of his gaze suggests his steady regard of his features in a mirror and his translation of them into art. The muted, somewhat dark color scheme here of olive tones enlivened by blues and reds adds to the firm quality of this painting. If we move 10 years further in time, Cezanne's hillside in Provence from about 1890 to 92, we can now see the logical extension of the style to landscape. We should keep in mind Cezanne's quest to make a more permanent art than Impressionism allowed. And if we contrast this image with Monet's water lily pond of a few years later, we can see what he meant. Certainly their choice of landscape views is significant. Monet's scene is by definition all color and light with moving foliage and water reflections. Cezanne shows instead the rocky landscape of Provence with its bright, even sunlight. The hillside shows as green fields and part of a village, but here too Cezanne has painted a grid of colored patches. Geometry is again paramount in this kind of landscape that Cezanne turned to repeatedly in his art. Note, however, the slightly contrary sense of the trees here, which, though patchy, are blurred and to some degree even blended in color. This suggests movement within the scene, but a movement controlled by the order of the large outcropping below and the hillside above. Even the rigorous limitation of colors to green, brown, and blue-gray works to further the sense of structure. Cezanne drew his composition with a pencil on the canvas, then filled in the forms with his patches of color. At times, Cezanne's oil paintings, such as this one, and his watercolors looked very similar. Throughout, he took care to maintain the balance of a two-dimensional design on the surface with the suggestion of spatial recession. Bathers, from about 1894 to 1905, represents another of Cezanne's favorite themes, the nude in a landscape. Here's Cezanne's interest in the art of old master painters, such as Poussin, a predecessor he revered, is recast in the modern forms of post-Impressionism. 
A group of female nudes has gathered in a landscape setting. Some sit, others recline. One at the far left seems to be disrobing to join with her fellow nudes. While there are echoes of specific themes with nudes from the past, such as, say, Diana and her nymphs or Bach and Alls, all traditional symbolism has been stripped away here to leave the essential subject to stand on its own. Personality is also stripped away here. The women's faces, when visible, are reduced to the sparest suggestion of geometric features of eyes and noses. Patches of color model the bodies, but still hold them to the surface design as well. The background of vegetation, clouds, trees, and sky seems to suggest some motion with the somewhat freer paint application there. The women, though, seem arranged for eternity. This canvas was one of three large depictions of bathers Cezanne worked on over the last years of his life. It measures over four by six feet. His decision to work and rework these paintings over a long period of time is reminiscent of an artist like Titian, as was the challenge of working in a new style. This painting was exhibited in 1907, the year after Cezanne's death, and admired by a new generation of artists, among them Picasso and Matisse. Just as there had been more than one kind of Impressionist painting, there were various paths taken in post-Impressionism. Georges Seurat was as analytical as Cezanne, but the result of his work was quite different. Seurat, whose dates were 1859 to 1891, was an artist whose life was short, but whose impact was great. Paris-born of the middle class, Seurat had a conventional artistic training, but opened his eyes through reading about color theory, going to the Louvre, and visiting the fourth Impressionist exhibition in 1879 when he was 20. Afterward, he worked in a studio with like-minded friends to develop his own modern style. The National Gallery owns eight paintings by Seurat. Many of them were, uh, are small studies for larger works. Bathers at Anniers, signed from 1884, was the first major result of Seurat's search for a meaningful contribution to contemporary art. It built upon some of the same premises as Impressionist works, but the result was truly a post-Impressionist art. Interest in modern subjects of leisure is still evident here. In fact, even more assertively than in Impressionist paintings of the 1870s. The boys and men here are working class figures. Anniers was an industrial suburb of Paris. Thus, we have gone beyond the Impressionist attention to the middle classes of Paris. Rather than suggesting a fleeting moment, Seurat created a timeless sense. For instance, while they sit or recline on the grass or stand in the water, all but one of the figures is shown in a profile view, long understood in art as a less transitory pose. While sailboats and skiffs dot the water and smoke rises from a nearby factory, all seems frozen and still. Like the old masters he admired, Seurat prepared this large-scale painting carefully through a series of both drawn life studies for individual figures, as well as 14 small sketches in oil painted out of doors all at Anniers. He began to work on it in 1883 and exhibited it first in 1884. There is a dialogue here between modernity and the old masters as well. The pale bodies of these workmen might be a result of their factory work, but they also serve as reminders of Seurat's interest in Piero della Francesca's art and its purity of form. The scale of the painting is also more reminiscent of traditional art. It measures nearly six and a half by ten feet. But of course, the subject is not from classical literature or the Bible, but is a non-textually based personal interpretation of modern life. One last notable quality of this painting is the bright and yet controlled use of color. Seurat smoothed over individual brush strokes for the bodies of his figures while emphasizing them more for the grass, water, and trees. Note, however, how up close one can see some bright unblended touches of red-orange in the hair of the youth at the center of the painting. Nonetheless, the application of paint is more regularized than in Impressionist paintings. Just two to three years later, Seurat developed his technique of 
pointillism, pointillism, where dots of color, evenly sized and shaped, were used to create large-scale paintings that glowed with color but maintained their sense of monumentality. The third of our post-impressionist painters is perhaps the best known and most loved, the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh. Van Gogh, whose dates were 1853 to 1890, worked as an art dealer, teacher, and lay preacher before becoming an artist, who often depended on the moral and financial support of his brother, Theo. Vincent only came to Paris in 1886, where he was exposed to both Impressionist and post-Impressionist art at the same time. Seurat and his colorism made a very big impression on Van Gogh. In 1888, he left to live first in the south of France and later outside Paris. Most closely associated with Paul Gauguin, with whom he worked for a short time in Arles, he developed a highly personal style. While his own life story is colored by his bouts of mental illness and suicide, his art was the product of hard work and consideration of the art of his contemporaries. There are four paintings by Van Gogh in the National Gallery. While Van Gogh painted a number of self-portraits in the traditional sense, even if they aren't traditional in appearance, he also depicted objects that stood in for him in his art. Van Gogh's chair, signed from 1888, serves as a fine example. We look from above down onto the simple wooden chair with a rush seat, which stands on a red tiled floor. To the right, a door can be seen. A pipe and tobacco paper lie on the chair seat. This is all simple enough, yet the colors used, these bright yellows, greens, and blue-greens, earthy reds and oranges, stand up from the surface in thick strokes, often unblended. Likewise, the chair leg that is closest to us at the left splays out in an ungainly fashion and unbalances the design to a degree. The floor tiles do not work in the kind of traditional perspective arrangement that had dominated European art since the Renaissance. Instead, they rush upward to meet the door and the wall, upending any regular presentation of space. This is descriptive, but outside the conventional naturalism, and interpretation now seems to take first place. The situation in which this painting was made is significant to understanding it. Van Gogh painted it in late 1888 when he and Gauguin were in Arles. He also painted a companion picture showing Gauguin's chair, now in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. They form quite a contrast with Gauguin's more impressive wooden chair, floral carpet, and candle lighting the scene. This painting suggests comfort compared with the spare, humble scene of Van Gogh's chair. Yet they could be arranged to face each other in a kind of dialogue, such as the two artists conducted in the best of their exchanges while in Arles. Sunflowers, signed, is one of four paintings of the subject from the summer and fall of 1888, and the one most closely associated with the painter. It was painted in Arles shortly before Gauguin joined Van Gogh there for a few months. Van Gogh hoped to use these paintings as a decoration for Gauguin's bedroom. Vincent wrote to Theo about this series and mentioned one in particular that had 14 flowers as the fourth he had painted. This must be the painting we see in the National Gallery. While he called the paintings a symphony in blue and yellow, this painting is intensely yellow with some touches of green and orange and just a small touch of blue on the vase and at the edge of the table where it meets the wall. Van Gogh associated the color yellow with cheerfulness and the bright sun of Provence. Clearly, he wished these paintings to serve to welcome Gauguin into their shared home. The thickly painted sunflowers capture the sense of texture and vividness and wildness of these large blossoms. Van Gogh shows them in the full range of their development and noted to Theo how quickly they withered as he studied them. It is not unreasonable to associate such a still life with ones by his Dutch predecessors that celebrated the beauty of blossoms while indicating their transience. While this painting can be connected with traditional flower paintings, it is resolutely modern in the flattened forms of the vase and table and the bright but unmodulated lighting. Van Gogh started with nature, but nature did not dictate 
how he interpreted it. A year after painting his sunflower pictures, Van Gogh was in a mental institution at Saint-Rémy, also in Provence. He continued to paint there, and a favorite subject from the summer and fall of 1889 is represented by a wheat field with cypresses. This version was begun in September. He had begun studying the cypresses near the hospital as early as June. He had arrived there in May. He wrote to Theo about painting the subject while a mistral, the strong wind of Provence, blew around him. Note, for instance, how bent over the small blue trees are that are in the left middle ground. Nature in motion is what Van Gogh captured so brilliantly here in the swirl of clouds, the spiraling cypresses, and the waving stalks of wheat set off by a few bright flowers in the foreground. Behind, though, remaining unmoved are mountains, solidly anchoring the painting and lending their own seeming permanence to this image of fleeting nature. But again, this is not the impressionist fleeting view of nature, one that attempted to capture optical sensations, but rather Van Gogh's response to this landscape. Nature was alive for him here, and he seems to have been almost enraptured while standing in the midst of it. The paint strokes are incredibly varied in length, thickness, and shape. No one type of stroke would work to capture the different effects Van Gogh wanted to convey. While Van Gogh had been impressed with Seurat's use of color, his own goes much further in its daring. The black-green of the cypresses had fascinated him, and he used them here to contrast with its otherwise vibrantly bright painting, which mixes warm and cool tones freely. If there ever was an artist who could capture joy in the midst of personal despair, it was unquestionably Van Gogh. We'll end our survey of paintings with one work by Henri Rousseau, a self-taught painter who worked near Paris at the end of the 19th century. Rousseau, whose dates were 1844 to 1910, had been a low-level civil servant who retired in 1893. But he had already begun to paint surprisingly ambitious works in the 1880s and even exhibited alongside an artist such as Seurat in the Salon des Indépendants in 1886. Some viewed him as just a naive amateur. Others saw in him a figure of poetic and visual imagination. Surprised, assigned to dated painting from 1891, is Rousseau at his most wonderful. This was the first of his jungle scenes and was exhibited the same year it was made. According to Rousseau, the tiger was hunting explorers, not the other way around. Rousseau's imagination was not just limited to his paintings. He made claims, for instance, that he had been a soldier in Mexico, but there is no evidence whatsoever to support this idea. Clearly, nothing like this jungle ever existed in Mexico anyway. Rousseau would study plants on display in Parisian botanical gardens, and his images of wild beasts generally derived from zoos or from other works of art. Here, the tiger seems to have been borrowed from a work by Eugène Delacroix. The artist changed the scale of natural elements freely and did not limit himself to conventional perspective systems. Note here how the tiger seems to float on the grasses. Yet the paintings were made meticulously and have a tapestry-like effect, especially those on the larger scale, such as this one, which measures over four by five feet. Isn't Rousseau's assertion of his imaginative vision what artists had been working towards for centuries? Didn't other largely self-taught artists, such as Van Gogh, prove that traditional training was no longer the most relevant qualification for making great art? And finally, isn't the insistence on interpretation over naturalistic depiction what really defines the break in art that would usher in the 20th century and its radically reconceived definitions of art? I think this is a fine place to stop as we stroll back out to the central staircase of the National Gallery in London and, if on site, take a break for tea. Thus ends our survey of European paintings from about 1250 to 1900 in the National Gallery in London. If we stop for a minute to consider the developments in European painting over the span of some 650 years, we note striking changes. At the beginning of the course, we saw some paintings by artists whose names we don't even know. They had functioned as simple craftsmen. By the end of the course, artists were often greatly admired for their creative ability and special gifts of seeing. 
When their art was not understood or accepted, such painters nonetheless retained faith in their own talents and vision, no matter the public reception. At the beginning of the course, Christian subjects were almost the only ones to be painted, and even when portraits were made, they often included Christian symbolism to indicate that the patron was indeed pious. By the end of this course, the situation was almost completely reversed. Secular subjects dominated the world of painting, and few religious works were made by the artists we have encountered here. The expansion of subject matter, not just to the secular world, but to so many subjects within the secular world, has been a theme that developed almost lecture by lecture here. We've also seen changes in the materials used by painters, with the move from wooden panels to canvas supports, which helped to facilitate the growth in size of many kinds of paintings, and the development of oil, uh, oil paints that largely replaced tempera and helped artists develop the naturalistic style of painting that dominated European art from 1400 to 1850. As the production of pigments became more commercialized and the product of scientific research rather than artistic discovery, we witnessed the final separation of the painter from older craft traditions. Now artistic vision rather than technical know-how was considered the paramount quality needed to be a successful painter. All of this can be learned from one splendid painting collection. I hope that if you should visit the National Gallery in London, you will use the contextual information about painters and the development of artistic trends I have presented in this course and apply it to the other wonderful paintings in the museum I have not had the chance to discuss. In truth, with the exception of a small handful of objects, such as the Leonardo cartoon, I could have chosen an entirely different set of paintings from this collection to discuss with equal success. That is how rich the National Gallery is in the art it owns. As I mentioned in the first lecture, this is the best museum collection to study in the world if you wish to understand the developments we have traced in European painting from 1250 to 1900. Why would that be true? Because the National Gallery collection has such depth and breadth in works from the different periods and countries. This is the result of the decision to collect only European paintings. Of course, that means you won't see or find out about the range of objects or different cultures that you will encounter at an encyclopedic museum, such as the Louvre in Paris or the Metropolitan Museum in New York but you will find a deeper and more balanced collection of European paintings in the National Gallery in London than in either of these other museums, even though they too own masterpieces of European painting. Once there, if you want to learn more about painting from these periods and countries, the National Gallery makes it possible to do so in a variety of ways. There are computers available on site to help visitors learn more about the collection, the gallery was actually a pioneer in using computers in the museum environment. And there are bookstores that sell the many excellent National Gallery publications that help to explain the collections. Everything about this museum suggests a passion for its public mission, and that, too, makes it a great museum. Finally, I owe great thanks to the curators, framers, scientists, educators, and especially to the director of the National Gallery, Nicholas Penny, for meeting with me and allowing us to make this course with their much appreciated help and advice. I can't think of a greater pleasure, and I thank you for your attention during these lectures.